Happy Sabbath, everyone. And we want to welcome you to the Wellington SDA Live. We welcome one and all, wherever you are at this time, whether you're in England, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in the Caribbean, or whether you're in the U.S., we welcome you. We hope you had a wonderful week and that in spite of the current situation and circumstances, that God's blessings has been upon you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you every Sabbath um, at this place. And we pray that as you have logged on, that you will receive a tremendous blessing as we study God's word together. We also, friends, want to encourage you guys, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, it is very imperative you do so. You can go to the, um, YouTube and type in Wellington SDA, click the subscription button, and that will notify you every time we go live. Also, we encourage you to share this link with your family members, your friends, co-workers, yeah, even your enemies, that they can be blessed by the programs that we put forth on this particular uh, um, uh, channel. We also want to highlight that we have the Voice of Hope Prayer. And uh, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, you can call the number 305 6 Seven six four one one three, and then you, through that number, you can <coughs> actually verbalize your request, and someone will take that request, and will be praying for you. Our number to, to log on in the morning for our prayer session is five six one four four zero sixty eight fifty four, and our times of operations are from five a.m. Sunday through Saturday. Uh, midday prayer is from 12 p.m. and evening prayer is from 7 p.m. Uh, Mondays through Thursdays. Also, friends, if you have not um, um, added, uh, uh, given us your email address, if you'd like the lessons for this particular series or other series you, you, you've seen, you viewed on, the, on my YouTube channel or the um, church's channel, you can, to receive study guides, <coughs> you can um, email us at info at wellington.com or c.not c not at the final movements.com and we'll do our very best to get these study guides out to you on a timely manner. Now friends, with all that said, we also want to say that um, at 5 o'clock um, we will be doing a Bible study series entitled Context in the Crisis. So we go live at 5 also and we also have a study guide for that particular series. So again, if you'd like the study guides for these series, we pray that you'll send us your info and we, we can definitely get them out to you. Again, we want to say a happy Sabbath, especially to our Wellington SDA family, the Wellington Project. Um, we hope that you are safe and sound and that you'll continue to take necessary precautions to keep, your safe, to keep yourself safe and your family safe as we weather this particular storm. Now, friends, we are going to <coughs> continue our study. We're going through a series entitled Desert Lessons, the movement of Ja people. And we're actually on lesson number three. And I want to encourage you guys, if you've logged on for the very first time, you need to go back and view the, uh, the preceding lessons. And lesson one is entitled Type and Anti-Type, and lesson number two is entitled Goshen, because we're building, we're building. Now, lesson three is entitled today, A Fallen Away, a very serious sobering and searching and solemn message. Now we're going to have a word of prayer and we hope that you have your Bibles, preferably that old good old 1611 the King James Version Bible, and that you have your study guides and that you have something to write with and that you're in a frame of prayer as God is going to speak to you at this moment. Now we're going to have a word of prayer. Um, I'm going to kneel and I'm going to ask if, you're, if it's possible you can kneel with me as we beseech the throne of grace for mercy and also enlightenment as we study. Let us, let us pray. <clears throat> o most kind and loving Father who art in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful, dear Lord, for your Sabbath, the rest that you have given to mankind. And as we have entered into your rest, dear Father, even now we pray that you'll forgive us for the sins that we have committed against you in word, in thought, and in deed. O God, may you have mercy upon us, we pray. May you blot our sins from out the book and may you give us not just forgiveness but, Lord, strength to come out of sinful weakness and to live a victorious life. 
Now, Lord, we're about to open your inspired book to look into those things that pertain to your kingdom. We ask and pray even now, dear God, that you will put a blessing upon it. All those who, are, who have logged on at this time, may they also receive a blessing. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move right into our lesson, lesson number three. And again, it's entitled A Fallen Away. Now, our thematic text for this series is found in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, and it says, for whatsoever things are written aforetime, or written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Friends, we're living in a time where we definitely need some hope. Isn't that right? And so as we study God's word, as we study the Bible, we'll definitely gleam hope from those who have gone on before us. And our thematic quote for this series is taken from Testimonies to Ministers, page 31. Some of the Lord says that we have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us <coughs> and his teachings in, in past history. So friends, I believe that the brightest days of, for the remnant church is still ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And that as we expect great things from God, we plan to attempt great things for God. Now, when last we left, we were using a, 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 a quote found in 1 Corinthians 11. And we've, we've showed you that, that there are three... Um, passages that we are encouraged we should read once per week and I hope you're doing this friends Psalms 105 Psalms 106 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 the Apostle Paul says in verse 11 now all these things happen unto them for ensamples or examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come the Apostle Paul here is writing to the the Christian church and he's actually surveying the history of ancient Israel Israel as a, an example as a typology now, we've discussed that type and anti-types, they're never identical. They are only similar. Now, we're going to move right into our study. Now, again, we're using the, the, the question and answer uh, mode of, 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 of study. And we ask the questions. Very simple. We go to the Bible, we fill them in, and we make some comments, and we see what the Holy Ghost has to say to us today. Now, question number one now says, now, what are some of the many titles the spirit of prophecy applies to? to the remnant church. That inside gift that God has given to us, one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. What are some of the many titles that the spirit of prophecy applies to the remnant church? Now friends, as you study her writings, and I hope you are studying reading them, you'll find that she oftentimes likens God, likens the remnant church, to fill it in now, a, the people of God. And you'll find that reference in Acts of the Apostles, page 290. She says, quoting, uh, quoting Acts of the Apostles 290, she says, the admonition to the Ephesian church uh, should be heeded by the people of God today. Now, when she uses the people of God, she's not a reference, this is not a reference to, to general Christianity. This is a specific, itemized, select group of people, the people of God. She also likens them as the remnant church, as God's people. That's a possessive, God's people. And you'll find this reference in Signs of the Times, um, February 12, 1880. She says this, A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep the law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring a serious consequence upon the people of God today specific group of people not the general masses the people of god she also intensifies the the the, the terminologies now she makes them very more 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 relevant she said she likens them to modern israel not ancient but modern israel you'll find this in manuscript 4 1883 she says quoting for 40 years did it did unbelief murmuring and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. She says the same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. 
Then she also likens them now as the Israel of God. Interesting. We have the people of God. We have God's people. Then we have modern Israel. But then we also have the people of God. A very dear, dear terminology. This is found in early writings, page 34. She says, as God spoke the day and the hour of Jesus' coming and delivered the everlasting covenant to his people, he spoke one sentence, then paused. While the words were rolling through the air, the Israel of God stood upward, listened to the words as they came from the mouth of Jehovah, Jehovah, interesting, and rolled through the earth like a peal of the loudest thunder. So friends, and as you go through, you're going to find many more terminology she used, but we want to focus on the latter two um, this morning in our study session, uh, Falling Away, Modern Israel and the Israel of God. Now again, friends, we are looking at type and anti-type. They were the ancient Israel and we are now modern Israel. Israel. Now, this is the question now. Why and when and how did the Seventh Adventist Church uh, actually uh, took on the terminology? Why doesn't she liken it to the Baptist Church or the Pentecostal Church or the Holiness Church or the Jehovah's Witness? Why does she liken these terminologies to modern Israel, to the Israel of God, to the Seventh Adventist Church? At what point in our church's history, since our very inception, we actually became modern Israel? Israel, were we always modern Israel? We're going to find it as we go through this study. Now, let's, di let's, let's now digress a little bit now into the history of ancient Israel. Now, question number two now. With whom did the name Israel originate? Let's go to the book of Genesis. Now, friends, we're using our Bibles, okay? You need to get your Bibles for this series. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Get your King James Version Bible. Genesis chapter 32. In verse 24, we want to find where did the name Israel originate from. Genesis 32, 24 says now, And Jacob, underscore, was left alone, and there he wrestled, underscore, with a man until the break of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. As he wrestled with him, underscore wrestling. Twice uh, Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, emphasized the word wrestling. Verse 26 says now, <clears throat> And he said, Jacob, the angel now, Let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except you bless me. 27 says now, And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with man and hath prevailed. Friends, the etymology, the etymology, the genesis of the word Israel did not come from Abraham or from Adam. It came from the, the, the person, the character Jacob. So when you think Israel, you must think Jacob. When, let's go back. When you think Israel, you must think wrestling. When you think Israel, you must think one who prevails. Are you with me? Now, friends, this is serious now. So Jacob, now, in order for us to put things in its context, and I haven't forgotten my title, A Fallen Away, we need to understand uh, the personality and the character of this individual Jacob. Now, I've, uh, this is not in your hand, but you probably could take a picture I've done a, a brief uh, synopsis of Jacob's life, and some of you guys may know it. Now, Jacob was born to Rebecca and Isaac. He was born to Rebecca and Isaac, right? Now, I Isaac's father was Abraham, right? Abraham, right now, right? Now, Jacob's grandfather was Abraham, and the Bible called Abraham God's friend. As a matter of fact, one of the few persons God spoke face to face to, Abraham, right? Jacob's uh, twin brother was Esau, and Esau was the eldest. Now, friends, when I, in ancient times, when, I, when, when the eldest was born, he received special blessings. He would get the financial blessing. He would get the priestly blessing, the, the Messiah, or he may be the progenitor of the Messiah. Jesus Christ may come through his lineage. Jacob and Esau 
even though they were twins, they were very different in character. Uh, Esau was a more homely fellow, a mother's boy. But, 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 but pardon me, Jacob was a, was a mother's boy, a homely. Esau was a more ragamuffin, rough kind of a fellow, wild. And he liked uh, he was he liked the butterfly life, uh, a lot of motion and no mobility. And when you read on that, the house was divided because Jacob, uh, the part of me, Isaac loved Esau in spite of his dubious and damnable lifestyle. But Rebecca loved uh, Jacob. Watch it now, friends. Rebecca now convinces Jacob to join her in her deception to secure the birthright through fraud <laughs> friends uh, 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 even though they had succeeded in gaining the birthright at what a cost uh, it cost them great uh, hardship it cost them great sorrow as a matter of fact uh, when she had told him to go you know go to your uh, my brother Laban for a few months you know Jacob never saw his mother again and the next time Jacob saw his mother will, will be resurrection morning Follow me now, right? Now Esau is enraged at Jacob as he flees to his uncle Laban's house who was a bigger deceiver. Now friends, I've realized for every, every con man, there's always a bigger con man. And boy, we, we, we thought Esau, Jacob was the made off, made off with the birthright, made off with the blessing. When he got down to Laban, Laban was a bigger made off, mm. bigger con man. Now friends, let me say this, all of us have a little bit of Jacob in us. That's imperative. All of us have some Jacob syndrome in us. Now, while he's down there in Laban's now, Jacob is the victim of deceit because after all, you reap what you sow. If you don't reap it, even your children will reap it. Firstly, for seven years of service, Jacob's uncle Laban kept him in marrying his eldest daughter Leah. What a deception. I don't know how that one worked, but boy, seven years. And, and, and then now, Laban is made, J Laban now made, makes, makes Jacob work another seven years so he could marry the youngest daughter, Rachel, right? Who had been Jacob's first choice. Now, this is polygamy. It was never acceptable. And friends, let me say this. Polygamy is still being practiced today in Remnant Church. It is called serial polygamy. Mm -hmm. Check upon me. You know, we like to lambash and beat down the Mormons, but friends, we have some Mormonism amongst us. Mm -hmm. We have some among us. Now, friends, so what we see now, Laban gives Jacob a six mm -hmm. for a nine. Now, friends, I've been living some while. Now, I, I look back on my life. I've given many people six for nine. Now, all of us have some Jacob syndrome in us. Now, you know, one of the reasons why uh, Jacob did not really like Leah, who was the eldest, the Bible describes Leah, uh, he, Bible uses a very a term, a, a unique term to describe Leah's facial features. In the book of Genesis 29, 27, the Bible says that Leah was tender-eyed. Now, I thought that this tender-eyed meant something good. And as I began to do some research, that tender-eyed really means that, <clears throat> that, they, that, that they made her eyes, made them moister and red. And so she was not too fun to look at. Now, she had red eyes. And I could imagine in the morning time, the mucus would form in your eye. And we call it mouth. And Jacob said, no, sir, can't bother with that. No kind of tender-eyed thing around here. So he did not look in favor with tender hide Leah, but oh, he loved him some uh, 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 Rachel. Now, now, watch it now. After 20 years in Hamron, God now tells Jacob he needs to return home. God now blesses Jacob abundantly, right? And he secretly gathers his family and property and set out back to Canaan. Now, he did not tell Laban, he was leaving now. Now, bear in mind, Esau is still upset with him. Esau haven't forgotten, haven't forgotten, nor has he forgiven him. So Jacob now leaves with his two wives, his children, his servants, his cattle. Are you with me? When Laban realized now, he gathers a posse and set off in hot pursuit. Soon he, he now catches up to Jacob 
a, a slow moving caravan near Mount Gil Gilead. Now, when Jacob is near Can land of Canaan, he sent messengers of peace to Esau. The messengers now return and say, guess what? Your brother Esau has gathered over 400 fighters and he's on his attack. Now, friends, Jacob is now caught in what we call a pickle. He's now caught in what we call a rock and a hard place. What do you mean, friends? After all, he cannot go backwards because Laban is coming. And he can't go forward because Esau is coming. And by the way, Satan has moved upon Laban and Satan has moved upon on, on, on Esau. The only person that he can turn to now is God. This is what we call now Jacob time of trouble. Now look what Jacob does now, right? Jacob now uh, uh, is shaken mentally, physically, and he prepares for Esau's arrival in three ways. One, he, par he prepared for the battle by dividing his camp into two. So if one group escapes, the other should survive the attack. Secondly, he sent a large amount of livestock and servants to Esau as a tribute. And number three, he now turns to God with humble, heartfelt prayer. He did what he could. And then he prayed. You know, we oftentimes think that prayer is to take the place of duty. No, my dear friends. Here, Jacob did what he could, and then he turned to the arm of strength. Now, I'm, I'm reading now from Patriarchs and Prophet, page 196. So the Lord says now, Jacob bowed in deep distress upon the earth. It was midnight. All that made life dear to him were at a distance, exposed to danger and death. Bitterest of all was the thought that it was his, his own sins that had brought this peril upon the innocent. With earnest cries and tears, his prayers before God, suddenly a strong hand was laid upon him. He thought it was an enemy who was seeking his life, and he endeavored to wrest himself from the grasp of his assailant. In darkness, I love this, the two struggled for mastery. Not a word was spoken, friends. But Jacob put forth all his strength and he did not relax his efforts for a moment. While he was thus battling for his life, the sense of his guilt pressed upon his soul. His sins rose before him to shut him out from God. The patriarch Jacob now discerned the character of his antagonist. He knew he had been in conflict with a heavenly messenger. And this was why his almost uh, superhuman effort did not gain the victory. It was Christ, Christ in his pre-incarnate pre state. The angel of the covenant who had revealed himself to Jacob. The patriarch was now disabled and suffering the keenest pain, but he would not loosen his hold upon God. His hip had slipped out of joint, but he was so fixated, so fastened on the blessings that that what he sought uh, did not, that the pain could not overshadow. Are you with me? All penitent, he clung to the angel and he wept and made supplication. He must have the assurance his sins are forgiven. Physical pain was not sufficient to divert his mind from the object. His determination grew stronger, his faith more earnest and persevering until the very last. The angel tried to release himself. What a grip, Lord have mercy. Uh, he urged, let me go. For the day break breaketh, let me go. I must go back to heaven. Let me go. Jacob said, I will not let thee go except you bless me. Had this been a boastful, presumptuous, confident, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed. But, his, but it was assurance of one who confesses his sins unworthiness, his unworthiness, yet trust the faithfulness of a covenant keeping God. She says, as an evidence that he had been forgiven. His name had been changed from one that, that reminds him of his sin to one that com com commemorated his victory. Thy name to the angel shall be called Jacob, a supplanter, a, 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 a deceiver, but to Israel, one who overcomes, friends. So when Ellen White likens us to Israel, you must think these are people who have overcome. 
These are people who are wrestling with God, brothers and sisters. These are the average, the average Joe Blow on the block. These are people who are who are wrestling with God day and night. These are people who are, who are who, who who have gotten and are gaining and are maintaining a consistent, victorious Christian life. Does that describe you, my dear friends? I pray God it does describe your Christian experience and it describes mine. You know, friends, you know what? We are told that history is going to be repeated. What do you mean, preacher? Now, I haven't forgotten my title. Hey, follow, I'm just taking the long route this morning. Um, I-95 as opposed to turnpike. Now, question number three now says now, whose experience must we pass through before we enter heaven? In the book of Jeremiah, let's go to Jeremiah, was the last prophet before God brought the Babylonians to Israel destruction in 586 BC. He is known as the weeping prophet Jeremiah. And oh, how Jeremiah would weep. And they beat up Jeremiah. They threw Jeremiah in a prison. And finally, Jeremiah, he wrote these words in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30. Let's go there quickly now. Jeremiah chapter 30. Look at verse number 5. Here, Jeremiah now, he takes an experience, a chapter, a page, out of the life of Jacob and he throws it into the future. The Bible says now, For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Let me just switch this out, please. Pardon me. All right. All right. Jeremiah 30, verses 5 and 7. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear, not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth not travail with child. And woman can tell us that men don't know what pain really is unless you have given childbirth. Wherefore, do I see every man with his hands on his loin as a woman in travail and all faces turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Friends, those who enter heaven at last in these last days, they must pass through a severe and intense time of trouble known as Jacob's time of trouble. You think you have trouble? Huh? You think coronavirus is trouble? Friends, we don't know what trouble or what trouble is. Serious trouble is coming. It's going to be so excruciating. It will be as if a woman, a man is giving birth. We must pass through Jacob's, Jacob's time of trouble. Fill it in. Jacob's, Jacob's trouble. Patriots and prophet, she, Ellen White says this now. The experience during the night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God not shall pass or will pass or ought to pass or intend to pass but must pass before Christ's second coming. And if we say that Jesus Christ is coming soon, then Jacob's time of trouble must come sooner. Now, where would, we, where would we put Jacob's time of trouble? Now, here's a chart that depicts the end of time. Jacob's time of trouble falls under the falling of the seven last plagues. Now, bear in mind, Laban didn't touch Jacob, neither Esau. So Jacob's time of trouble was not brought on by persecution. It wasn't bought, brought on by physical abuse. It was a mental anguish he was going through. And so this takes place during the seven last plagues. And we have more to say upon that as we go for, forward in future lessons. Now, friends, this same wrestling with God, it will depict the people of God's prayer life before Jesus comes.
you can jot this reference down. Early writings, page 269. Not in your hand. She says now, I saw some, not all, with strong faith, agonizing cry, pleading with God. Their countenance were expressive of an internal struggle. Firmness, great earnestness were expressed in their countenance. These people were wrestling with self. Jacob was wrestling with his old lifestyle. She says, uh, some I saw did not participate in the agonizing pleading. They seemed indifferent and they seemed careless, brothers and sisters. Does this describe your prayer life? Does this describe my prayer life? Let me just switch my mic out one more time, please. Thank you. Does this describe your prayer life? Does this describe my prayer life now, friends? When we think Israel, we must think wrestling. We must think overcoming. Now, note in your handout now, Israel, therefore, means now to contend. Israel means to fight, yeah. not on the level of behavior. Mm. Our fight is in the mind. Mm. You are your worst enemy. The Bible says that the dragon, Satan, went to make war with the woman. Where is this war taking place? In Romans, Paul says, I see another war in my mind. The war, the great controversy is in your mind. So if you take on the name Israel, you must think contend. You must think fight. You must think overcome you know as i as i thought about this my mind reflected back uh, a few weeks ago before the all the parks were shut down uh, we went there to exercise and i saw fire russ and um he came out to exercise also and when he came out of the car you know he hailed me and so forth and he had he had an, another fella sitting here, sitting with him in the car when he came out he said pastor this is my brethren and his name is israel and, and this man had long ponderous locks and his name was israel and i thought interesting israel and did you know right after that i saw that same man went in his pocket and this man pulled out the biggest ganja spliff i've ever seen in my life mm -hmm. i said to myself he ain't no israel mm -hmm. he's a deceiver he's a trickster mm -hmm. when you think israel you must think one who's overcoming bad habits mm -hmm. an overcomer one who contends one who wrestles it was the name that God gave Jacob because of his perseverance in struggle. His name change to Israel was a blessing. A change of name is an is indicament of a change of character. You go back to Daniel chapter 1. When Daniel went to Babylon, one of the very first things Nebuchadnezzar did, he changed their names. Because a change in name indicates a change in character. And most artists today don't use their birth name. They go by a, 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 a stage name. And when they use their, their stage name, it, 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 it indicates a change of character, friends. So when we get a name change, we are getting a change of character. And by the way, everyone who overcomes, God will give them a new name. Amen. I, know I, I didn't really like my name growing up. It didn't have a ring to it. It just blah Carlton. And at one point, I wanted to change my name. My name is actually Carlton Alexander Knott. And I had planned to drop the name Carlton, drop the Carlton, and move my middle name to my first name, which is called Alexander, and go by Zander. Has a ring to it, isn't it? <laughs> but friends, God's going to give us a new name, all of us. I wonder what my new name will be like. When you think Israel, friends, you must think wrestling with God. Now, friends, I must admit, I used to like wrestling. Uh, 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 my favorite wrestler was, underscore was, a fellow by the name of um, The Undertaker. And he was dark and dismal. And there was an eeriness about him. He had the personification of death surrounding him. And he had a move called the tombstone. And when he put that move on you, it was lights out, friends. Do you know that prayer is likened or compared to wrestling? Mm. Yes. Now, when you think of wrestling, friends, you think prayer. 
Now wrestling, not in your handout, wrestling is a single combat sport. It's a single sport, really. When you watch wrestling, it's a single combat. Friends, nobody can wrestle for you. Nobody can pray for you. Now, I can pray with you, but by and by, you're going to have to wrestle for yourself. Wrestling is also a close combat. Nobody wrestles from a mile apart. That ain't wrestling. You have to get close. Uh, you smell armpits. You get <laughs> saliva. You get musk. It's a close combat combat so when we wrestle with God in prayer we are drawing nigh unto God we are drawing nearer to God you see the whole Christian life is one continual wrestling with sin with temptation and the devil himself friends we're gonna have to learn to wrestle when she says modern Israel these are people who wrestled with God now there are some errors I believe that we must intensify the wrestling. I believe we must, we must wrestle with wrestle for your marriage. Mm. You got to wrestle, my dear friend. Don't give up and give in. I know he's no good, but you made a vow. Wrestle for it. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, what God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. Wrestle for your husband. Wrestle for your wife. You've got to wrestle. You've got to contend. And if we wrestle as Jacob wrestled, God will save your husband. God will save your wife. The problem is we do not wrestle. We wrestle with cell phones and apps and gadgets and gadgets. You've got to wrestle for your marriage. Wrestle for that husband. Wrestle for that lazy wife. Yes, I know she's lazy. Then she doesn't cook. She doesn't clean. But you've got to wrestle. We must not just wrestle for our marriage. Mothers, you're going to have to learn to wrestle for your children. The Bible says, Lord, children are the heritage of the Lord. Ellen White says, a childless house is a desolate home. You've got to wrestle for your children, wrestle for them. You know, when I think about wrestling for your children, my mind rushes back to Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of John Wesley. She had 19 children. Nine of them died in infancy. And she had 11. And brothers and sisters, let me, if there was a woman that we need to highlight and underscore more often in women's ministry as opposed to these liberals on television, mm. it is Susanna Wesley. Mm. This was an old-fashioned woman. This woman wrestled for her children, the 11 of them, 11 of them, brothers and sisters. When I was in England, uh, you know, I visited the Wesley, uh, the Wesley's uh, chapel. And in that yard, there, there was a tombstone of, of the, the, the bones, the remains of Samuel, uh, Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother. Uh, and I knew that there was a godly woman beneath those, her bones, and godly bones. Mm. She wrestled, and Susanna Wesley had a rule of 16 rules in her house. You gotta look, look for them on, 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 on Google, it, it's worth reading. And she said that she would devote a, 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 a certain portion of the day to wrestle with God for all her 11 children, brothers and sisters. She would take them one by one in the room and she would put those hands upon them and she would wrestle for them boys, wrestle for them. She prayed, she wrestled. And you know what they became? I think about John Wesley. Oh, what a blessing to the world John Wesley has been. I think about Charles Wesley, brothers and sisters. They were the recipient of a mother wrestling and too many mothers are not wrestling. You spend too much time painting your toenail and painting your face and put, putting on makeup. You need to wrestle with your children. Wrestle with God for them. We spend, you spend too much time wrestling with the corporate America. And you really plan to go to hell rich. And we are in a crisis now. Money ain't no use. You can't buy and you can't even, so you can't even leave your home. Are you wrestling for your children? And you know what happened? When she died on her dying bed. One of the last words she uttered. And I pray that this will hit you like a brick this morning, mother. She said this on her dying bed. All which the Father level, I have lost none that the Father have given me. Can you say that for your sons, your daughters? You need to wrestle for them. And as long as there's life, there's hope. Ecclesiastes 9, 4 says, 
team that is joined to all living years hope. I'd rather be a living dog than a dead lion. Wrestle for your children. Don't give up on them. Another wrestling mother I think about is Mary Bell Washington. She was the mother of George Washington. And when George Washington uh, 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 went to take America's independence from the hand of tyrant England, Britain, he went to his mother and he told his mother and his old mother said, son, I'm going to pray for you. Mm. And she wrestled for that son. And you know what? He wrote this, quoting, at Fourth Cumberland, 1794, he said, by all powerful dispensation of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability mm. or ex ex expectation, for I had four bullets mm. through my coats, mm. two horses shot underneath me, yet I escaped unhurt, although death were leavening my companions all around. His mother was contending yeah. for this man. Begin even now to contend for your children. Amen. We need to wrestle for our marriage. Wrestle for our children. Israel. But we also need to wrestle for the congregation pastors. Mm. You know, too many pastors are wrestling with degrees. Mm. They spend their time getting PhD. And I'm going to say it, friends. I don't have a problem with degrees. I'm an educated person. Mm. I believe in education. But I have come to realize and recognize that in some cases, not all, the more degrees a pastor have is the further he gets from reality. Mm. He's out in La La Land is the mm. further he gets from Adventism. Mm. Mercy. They spend their time wrestling with, with, with atheistic concepts mm. instead of wrestling with God in prayer and putting forth wholesome sermons on Sabbath. And that is why the flock is so sickly. We need to wrestle more for our congregation. Wrestle with God in prayer so we can bring forth meat in due season. Mm. But alas, as while you wrestle for your marriage, wrestle for your children, wrestle for your community, you need to wrestle for yourself. Yes. yes, friends, you need to wrestle for yourself. You know, last night as I was going over my notes, it was about midnight. It's not good practice to go to bed so late. And I was about to shut down the computer and get some shut eye. The spirit said, oh, no, you better wrestle. Mm. You better tarry a little bit, not. And friends, an overwhelming feeling came over me. And I fell in my living room. And I began to wrestle for myself, wrestle for my wife, wrestle for my children, wrestle for Wellington, wrestle for the cause. You've got to wrestle sometimes. Mm. We are told in the book, Early Writings, write it down, page 273. Then why says, I ask the angel why there is no more faith, mm. power in Israel. Israel. He said, you let go of the arm of God too soon. Mm. You let go too soon. She says, press your petition to the throne of God in strong faith. Mm. So friends, as we think of Israel, we think of Jacob. So the first Israel's name originated from Jacob overcoming. Now, I haven't forgotten my title falling away now question number four now according to the apostle paul whom are we wrestling with ephesians chapter six paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood mm -hmm. but against principalities and powers and rulers in spiritual darkness friends we are wrestling against evil spirits mm -hmm. this is not a mere human to human encounter the people who at last overcome are those who are wrestling note these spiritual agents are set in motion and determined to hinder to block obstruct the christians entrance into heaven they usually manifest themselves in one of the following ways the world friends mm. we're going to have to wrestle against worldliness worldliness is not going to leave you alone mm. until the day you die the world still wants the center of your affection you're going to have to wrestle against the world, friends. We're going to have to wrestle against the flesh. And by the flesh, we mean passion. Passion ain't going to leave you alone. Adultery ain't going to leave you alone. Fornication ain't going to leave you alone. Masturbation ain't going to leave you alone. We're going to have to war against these things. Wrestle. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple of years ago, um, a man reached out to me. And he said, Pastor, not I, I need your help. I need your prayers. Uh, and I said, well, what is your issue? This man was 80 years old. Mm. Did you hear me? 
three score and ten by the reasons he has gone over. And he was married. He said, Pastor, don't you know I struggle? I said, what do you struggle with, my brother? He says, I struggle with lusting. I said, what? This old man with your old self? Yes. Lust wasn't going to leave this man alone. He had to wrestle even until the dying day, you're going to have to wrestle against these things. We must also wrestle against the devil. Satan's trinity of evil. The world, the flesh, and the devil, we're going to have to wrestle. Jacob wrestled. Israel overcome. Note now, Jacob's 12 sons were often called the sons of Israel after he passed off the scene. Or the house of Israel. The people, men of Israel, or the Israelites. Israel was also used as the name of the ten tribe, northern kingdom, who had broke away from the southern kingdom because of apostasy. Later on in the New Testament, the term was applied to Christians. Hold on now, friends. Hold on. Hold on. How do we get from ancient Israel, where the name was now shift to Christians? Now, on the screen, we have three Israel. Israel number one, we call ancient Israel. Israel number two, we call the, the New Testament church. And Israel number three, we're Ellen White likened as modern Israel. Now, how did we, how was the shift taking place? When and where? Why is it we have three Israel? Why aren't we all Jews? I'm going to show you, friends, that there was a shift in the Exodus. Now, let's look at God's first denomination. Who was God's first denomination? In Deuteronomy 7, 6, the Bible says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people, and that upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon thee, nor choose thee because there are more numbers, but because there were fewest of all people. But because the Lord chosen you, and because you would keep his oath, which he had sworn unto your fathers, the Lord hath brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondage of land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So the first denomination was ancient Israel. That was the Israel number one, just for emphasis. Israel number one. Israel number one. Note, ancient Israel was the very first denomination to exist. It was, visible, it was a visible earthly organization set up by God. They alone were to be God's chosen people. All others were considered Gentiles, mm -hmm. foreigners, and strangers. And friends, think, if God has a modern Israel today, which he does, everybody else has to be strangers, foreigners, or Gentiles. We are not all in the same boat. And through ecumenicalism, we don't put no difference between the Gentiles, the foreigners, and the strangers. Note, this did, not, this did not mean that God wouldn't allow anyone else to accept his truth and be a part of, of save that time. It did mean, however, that if anyone wanted to be a part of God's chosen, is the number one, they had to join. Not the other way around. They had to join. They had to physically leave where they were and join, brothers. There was no ecumenicalism. There was no kumbaya working together. And they had to be circumcised mm -hmm. of the foreskin, right? And practice the Jewish ceremonial service. Full stop. If you didn't comply, which point of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be a part of God's Israel, number one. Now, but then now we move to Israel in the New Testament. Watch it now. Number six now. In the days of the Apostle Paul, whom did the Apostle Paul liken as Israel? Now, this is after Paul has been converted. Christ has gone back to heaven. Holy Ghost had fallen. Paul is in full swing. His name is no longer Saul, but Paul. Are you with me? Now, in Romans 2, the Bible says now, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither that is of circumcision. Uh-oh. So he is, he is neutralizing Israel numbers one requirements, which is outward. But he is a Jew or Israelite or Israel, which is one outwardly circumcision of the heart and the spirit. The Apostle Paul here likens the true Israel in the New Testament time, filling now to those 
who had defected from Judaism, oh, oh, Israel number one, and, and heathenism. There was a defection from Judaism and from heathenism. What do you mean, preacher? I'm going to make it clearer. Question number seven now. What were those people called who had defected from Judaism and heathenism and had embraced the teachings of Jesus? In the book of Acts 11, 26, the Bible says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians at Antioch. Friends, they were called Christians. So in the New Testament time, the Israel of God were not the ancient Jews. It was the Christian denomination. Now watch it now, friends. Now something had to happen where God shifted from Israel number one to Israel number two. The answer was there was a falling away. And that's my title, A Fallen Away. Israel, number one, fell away. So God had to replace them. Are you with me? Now, question number eight now says now, what did God require of ancient Israel for this arrangement with him to remain in effect at when God called them? Deuteronomy 7, the Bible says now, Know ye therefore the Lord thy God, he that the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy, with them that love him and keep his commandments a thousand thousand and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them he will not be slack to him that hateth him he will repay him to this his face the bible says now therefore thou shalt keep his commandments his statutes and the judgment which i command thee this day wherefore it shall be it shall come to pass that if that if now he hearken unto these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto you the covenant and mercy which he shear unto the fathers. When God called ancient Israel number one, it was a contract, a covenant. What were the requirements? Filled in to love him and keep his commandments. This was the only condition of them remaining, remaining ancient Israel. Now, that word if, if you know, if is a conjunction, right? And a conjunction basically connects two or more sentences. So we think if, the Bible says, remember the text says, if he hearken, if, if, if is a conjunction. Therefore, if, if can mean, and again, a conjunction, <coughs> pardon me, connects words, clauses, and sentences together. If therefore mean, you can jot it down, in the event that. If means allowing that. If means on the assumption that. If means on the condition that. So there were only God's people as long as the if. The if. Note, God made a covenant, right? The if. That's what the if, right? In the event of allowing that. On the assumption that, on the condition that. Note, God made a covenant with ancient Israel based on the important condition if. The privilege of being God's chosen people was not based on birth, but upon character. It was their love and obedience, not the pedigree that determined the position before God. Friends, did you get that, friends? You got to get that, friends. We're not about pedigree now. I hear people say I was born in church. That means nothing. It's almost a condemnation. And those who are born in the church are foreign to God. Mm. Haven't you realized that some of the worst kids right now are children who were born to Seventh-day Adventists? Mm. They go further in the world. Mm. Are you with me, friends? Watch it now. And it shouldn't be. It should not be. Question number nine now. If ancient Israel did not keep their part of the covenant what did God say would happen to them? The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy 30 now, the Bible says now, See, I have set before thee life and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love thy Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, 
his statutes, his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. Are you with me? Verse number 17 says now, But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt draw away or fall away, and worship other gods to serve them, look what will happen now. Verse 18 says now, I denounce unto you this day that thou shalt surely perish, and that thou shalt not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to possess the friends. God says if they did not maintain their end of the bargain, they would surely perish. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. As it was with modern ancient Israel, so it is with modern Israel. We are only as good as we maintain our part of the bargain with God. Now, if, if now, if a, cov a covenant is a legal contract between two parties, if one breaks it, the other is not honor bound to keep his part at all. Many Christians today do not understand this, therefore insist that God cannot, cannot get out of fulfilling his promise to the Jewish people. They don't understand that a contract or a covenant is a, with two peoples. And if one breaks it, the other is at liberty to leave. Are you with me? <clears throat> Pardon me now. Number 10 now. If ancient Israel, number one, rejected knowledge, what will God do to them? Hosea 4, 6 says now, My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee and thy children. God would reject them. <clears throat> Friends, and that's exactly what ancient Israel number one did. That's why there was a shift. They did not keep their part of the bargain. And I want to read to you a very sad comment, a very sad comment. Volume 5 of the Testimony, page 445. The servant of the Lord paints it and she puts it pretty well. She says this, but they did not keep their covenant with God. They followed after idolatrous practices of other nations, other churches. And instead of making the Creator's name a praise in the earth, their course held it up to contempt of the heathens. Yet the purposes of God must be accomplished. The knowledge of his will must be spread around the earth. God brought the hand of the oppressors upon his people and scattered them captives among the nations in affliction. Many of them repented of their transgressions and sought the Lord. Scattered now throughout the countries of heathens, they spread abroad knowledge of God, right? The principles of the divine law came in conflict with the customs and practices of nations. The Lord in his providence brought his servants, Daniel, Nehemiah, and Ezra, face to face with kings and rulers that these idolatrous might have an opportunity to receive the light. Thus the work which God had given his people, Israel number one, to do in a time of prosperity in their own borders, but which they had neglected through their unfaithfulness, was done by them under great embarrassment and trial. Mm, okay. Are you getting the picture now, friends? Yeah. I hope you are. Now watch this thing now. A broken covenant now. How much time did God give the Jews, or Israel number one, to get it right? We've just completed the book of Daniel, so this should not be foreign to you. God gave his people 70 weeks. 70 weeks were determined, cut off, cut off from what? From the longest time prophecy, the 2,300 days, and given to his people and his holy city. Here it is, friend, the Jewish nation. God subtracted 490 or 70 weeks and gave to the Jews time of grace, 1810 left were for the Gentiles. Now, within that 70 weeks, they were to accomplish, I think, seven things. They were to finish transgressions. That means they had to stop sin. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. They had to bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision. And to anoint the most holy. Seven things should be accomplished. Fill in now within the 
70 weeks or the 400. So God gave them, fill it in, God gave them 70 weeks or 490 years. Israel number one. Now again, we don't have time to, to, to go over this. We had a whole lecture on it. You can go on the Wellington's channel or my YouTube channel and you'll find the 2000 day um, prophecy. I think it's like four parts. And we, we, we break down this particular prophecy. And again, if you want the handouts, do send us an email. Right? Note, the 490 were to be allotted to the Jewish nation as their final probationary time to God's favorite messengers of his grace. The 490 was cut off from the larger prophecy as their final opportunity to prove themselves acceptable to God, the other people, to carry the good news. As we know, they failed in their work, in the mission, and it was given to others. So by the time we get to the New Testament now, something happened where the Apostle Paul now no longer likened ancient Israel to Israel. He likened them to, to the Christian church, right? And so forth. Right Now, now we know that the, the, the 70 week prophecy began in 457 BC and it terminated in 34 AD, 34 years after Christ had gone to heaven. This was when it terminated in the stone of Stephen. We know this, friends. We, we should know this. This is history. As a matter of fact, I found this article uh, in the Catholic uh, Herald News said this. Stephen, the first martyr, remembered December 26. It says, on December 26, the Universal Catholic Church commemorates the death of Stephen in 34 AD. That's history. At 34 AD, something happened where God now left Israel number one and he shifted to Israel number two. So Israel number one, right? After 34 AD, friends, when they stoned Stephen, they no longer existed. God was now dealing with Israel number two, the New Testament Christian church. Who is a Jew, the Apostle Paul said? Not the one with the foreskin or outward. Those who had defected from Judaism and heathenism and had embraced the teachings of Jesus, they were the modern Israel. So it is true that Christianity in its very inception had held the title modern Israel. Now look what happened now. <clears throat> After ancient Israel's probationary time ended at the stone of Stephen in 34 AD, whom did God choose as his new representative? In Acts chapter 13, this is a powerful text. The Apostle Paul is preaching. He's way in his ministry now. There's a confrontation now with the Jews, those deceived people. In Acts 13, 45, the Bible says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, the Gentiles, they were filled with envy. Why were they angry? And spake against those things which were spoken by the Apostle Paul, contradicting and counteracting the Apostle Paul's word. And look what the Apostle Paul said now, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, him and Barnabas in verse 34, 46. The Bible says now, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, the original, Jacob's seed, but seen he put it from you, you judged yourselves unworthily, you judge yourselves of everlasting life. Lo, we now turn to the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were like, hallelujah. They were saying, hallelujah. So the Gentiles, brothers and sisters, the Gentiles is the answer. The Gentiles, right? God now turned to the Gentile nation. And he would carve out of that, uh, that heathenistic world a people who would follow him, keep his oath, keep his statutes, keep his commandments. They later on adopted the name Christians. So after 34 AD, the new Israel in the Bible was not the Jewish nation. It was the Christian church. Now, this is the question now. So why when Ellen White likens, uses the term Israel, she doesn't say all Christianity. Something had to happen in Christianity where the shift now was now, was now taken from Christianity 
to the remnant church. Note, <clears throat> so as the Jews became modern Israel, they had a tendency to think themselves better. Paul, therefore now, <clears throat> sought to warn them of self-exaltation. He said, Gentiles, you need to be careful. Now look what warning he gave to them. In the book of Romans now, Romans chapter 11. Now Paul, and this is a warning to me, it's a warning to all those who claim to be modern Israel. Romans chapter 11. The Apostle Paul is writing to these Gentiles now who are now modern Israel. Mm -hmm. Romans 11, 17, Paul says now, And if some of the branches were broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree grafted in, so you were grafted in mm -hmm. among them, and with them partakest thou of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Mm -hmm. He said now, you were grafted in. You were wild. God brought you in. Are you with me? He said, boast not thyself against the branches. Mm -hmm. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root tree. Thou will say, the branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. He said, well, because of unbelief, here it is, not disbelief. Are we going to talk about unbelief? Paul said, because of unbelief, they did not enter. He says, because of unbelief, God broke off the original. God, God, God got rid of them. He says, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. Don't think yourselves better. Be humble. Self-abasement. Are you with me? For if God spared not the natural branches, Lord have mercy, take heed that he spared not thee. If God gave up the original, and I'm no Jew, I'm a Jamaican. There's not a drop of Jewish blood in my ancestry. My grandfather came from Ghana. We're more African than anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm no Jew. I'm a Gentile that was grafted. So Paul is saying, don't boast yourself. Be humble. Because if you follow their faith, if he did that to the original, then those who were grafted in, don't stand a ghost of a chance if they did what the original did. So here we see now, now we learned last week, friends, that as long as the Israelites remain in Goshen, the land of draw near God prospered them. And Christianity, friends, began to grow. Paul says, and we're going to talk about it next week, it grew. The Bible said there were even saints in Caesar's household. It grew. It prospered as long as they remained in Goshen. But then came the great apostasy. Number 13, as we wind down now. <clears throat> After the Christian church, modern Israel, was fully established, what did the Apostle Paul predict would happen to them? Look what happened now. In the book of 2 Thessalonians 2, the Apostle Paul is warning modern Israel. He says, Now we beseech thee, you brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that he should not be shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word or by letter as of us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Here it is now. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there shall be a falling away first. And that's my title, a falling away first. Paul predicted that there would be a falling away in modern Israel, which was a Christian church, just as, as there was a falling away in ancient Israel. He also writes to them now that who would bring this falling away? Who would, who would be the author, the ringleader of this falling away? In Acts chapter 20, he tells us who would cause a falling away. Acts 20, 28, he says now, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made the overseer to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, my death, my demise, not just me, after Barnabas is gone, after the originals are gone, after C.D. Brooks is gone, talk to me now, after all these originals, 
original man, Joe Cruz, is gone. After Elder Moses Mace is gone. Talk to me now. After Anna Knight, after all the pioneers are gone now, shall grievous wolves enter in among you. These are people who will be installed, getting paid with the tithe money. Leaders among you. And they are not going to spear orthodoxy. They are not going to spear the flock. And look what he says now. Of your own self. There it is. Among yourself. This ain't the world. Of your own selves shall men. And men mean mankind. Male and female. Shall arise speaking perverse. Uh, pussy. Uh, damnable things. And they shall draw away disciples after themselves. Friends. There it is friends. They had far more to fear from within than without. And the hindrance of success comes from the church itself. Mm -hmm. Paul predicted a fall in a way. And for, brothers and sisters, what Paul predicted came to fruition. And because there was a fall in a way, God now had to reach out one more time mm -hmm. and to carve out another group of people and bestow upon them the name modern Israel. I'm going to read to you. Now, you want to read? You want to get the mic? I'm going to read to you. Um, and this is taken from Ellen White's writing. This is so pointing, right? Christian experience and teaching. She says this now. And I'm going to do some um, ad lib as she reads, right? She says, <clears throat> In fulfillment of these predictions, it is a matter of historical record that following the death of the last of the apostles of Jesus, some members of the Christian church began to depart from the simplicity of the truth as taught by Christ. And gradually, these church members were led to unite with the world in heathen practices. Friends, they had left Goshen. Go back to lesson two. They left Goshen and they began to mingle with the heathens, with their praise and worship, their way of running church, their preaching. Their funny socks and these funny bow ties. And they ain't saying nothing. Keep on reading, please. As the years passed by and the church increased in numbers and in popularity, there were many who became less and still less strict in their obedience to Bible teaching until finally in the 5th and 6th centuries... Oh, oh fix it. No, no, you do the math. Because we're going to qualify the 5th century. We need, we, we're going to put a date on that, Right? Keep on reading, please. After Christ, the greater number of those who claimed to be Christ, were, who claimed to be Christians. Modern Israel. Go ahead now. Were in reality not living in harmony with the teachings of Christ. And friends, the same thing happened today. Keep on reading, please. For many centuries thereafter, an apostate form of Christianity held sway. Uh -huh. The truth was suppressed and lost sight of and ignorance prevailed. Did you get that, friends? Friends, did you know? And I'm going to show you that we have entered the most ignorant phase of Seventh-day Adventist today. When you talk about country living, people say, what's that? You're going to Bush? Saints, we are so ignorant. We, are, we have entered the darkest mentality of God's people, friends. And look what happened, friends. They became less strict. So are we. There was a falling away. Are you with me? Keep on reading, please, she says. These centuries of apostasy are correctly designed in history, designated in history, the Dark Ages. And we're going to talk about that. Remember, friends, it was a midnight deliverance. Mm -hmm. Keep on reading, please. During this time, attempts were made to alter or to set aside many of the fundamental teachings of the Bible. Friends, as it was back then, it is happening today among modern Israel. Keep on reading, please. Under these circumstances, it is not surprising that in such a time as likewise in the centuries immediately preceding the first advent of Christ, the manifestation of the gift of prophecy almost wholly disappeared. Disappeared, friends. And we're going to qualify this next week. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss next week's study, friends. So here it is, friends. There was a fall in a way, a serious fall. Now look what happened now. Let's go back to my chart now. So God had Israel number one. Mm -hmm. They were the original, Right? Once the patriarch passed off the scene, they mingled with the heathens. And they had lost sight of the mission, the calling. And friends, God had to get rid of them. Because they broke their contract with God. Mm -hmm. Then 
God now called Israel number two, the Christian church. And they were going strong and they were going strong until Paul died of the scene. Then a new kind of Christian that came on the scene. Very foreign to Paul. And brothers and sisters, it got so bad. It got so bad that God had to one more time reach out to another group of people on the state of action. And they, he gave them the title Modern Israel. How did this happen? I'm going to show you next Sabbath. You don't want to miss it, right? Now, friends, you know, from this, I have the deuce. And you may disagree with me. It's okay. It's fine. I have discovered, based on my study and where we are in history, that Jesus has his favorites. Mm -hmm. There are 7 billion people today, but Jesus has his favorites. What do you mean? There are those people whom Jesus allows to lean on his bosom. Yes, there was a specific disciple who, who the Bible says who leaned on Christ's bosom. There are those disciples whom the Bible says whom Jesus loved. He loved. Jesus has his favorites. Jesus has his Josephs. You know, Joseph, Jacob loved Joseph. And that's why he gave him that, that coat. There are those people whom, who, 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 who draw nigh unto God. And God draws nigh to them. They are the spiritual Josephs. And that was why after Joseph was supposed to have been killed, that Jacob's affection turned to Benjamin. Because Benjamin was the was the was the was the was the um the, the son of the wife whom he loved. Are you with me? Are you with me, right? And so you see that Jesus has his Benjamins. Jesus has his as a matter of fact, Jesus also had those people whom he calls the apple of their eyes. Now watch this now, friends. Not in your handout. And, and, and upon them he bestows insights. He gives a little bit more as Jacob put a little bit more sack in Benjamin's uh, 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 sack, are you with me, than the others. Little f he has his favorites. Watch it now. William Sikar wrote this. Now where there is an overabundance of privileges, watch it now, there should be an overabundance of practice. Wow. Say, let, 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 let me just I black the screen. You got to think about that, friends. Yes. You just let that one simmer, sim simmer. Let it simmer this morning. Let me read it again. Where there is an overabundance of privileges or insights, there should be an overabundance of practice. We naturally expect more splendor from the beaming sun than from the burning of a candle. We expect more light from the sun than from a candle. We look for more moisture from the drops of a cloud than from the drops of the bucket. And God expects more from the remnant church than from the churches of Babylon. Yeah. Because after all, he allows the remnant church to lean on his bosom. Yeah. Are you with me, friends? These are the people whom Jesus loved. Mm. But alas, friends, there has been a falling away. Mm. You know, when you look at the Adventist church, it can be depicted from this, gar this, this, this chart. We liken it in stages. The Avenue Church was established between 1884 and 1863. We call this the pure faith. Mm -hmm. Our pioneers were in full swing. Now they had their differences, but they never differed in doctrine and orthodoxy. Yeah. They were all on the same theological page in regards to the sanctuary and the work and the mission. There were no isms and schisms, friends. Mm -hmm. They did not have time to, 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 to put on the agenda whether or not we're going to take out the word deaconess at the next general conference session and call it deaconate. That's of the, that's of the devil. Mm -hmm. That's of serious falling away, friends. Mm -hmm. That's how we waste the Lord's money mm -hmm. to discuss these trivial, no, these foolishness. 40 years a generation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you something now. 40 years from that brings us to 1901. Mm -hmm. All right? The prophet is still alive. The devil is still attacking Drop a little more drop. And I, I'm going to qualify all these days. But things, you could work with this. Prophet died in 1915. This brings us to 1939. And, and these are all historical dates. Something happened, pivotal, in our church within these dates. Check upon me, right? The devil, he drops more. He dilutes. He dilutes 
Adventism. Falling away gradually. Not openly, but gradually. Forty years later now, 1955 came on the scene. Question and doctrine, Martin and Barnhouse. The devil now begins to dilute. He drops more water. He dilutes the message. Now, friends, if you came into church 55, you haven't heard about 1901. And when you hear 84, you think people are fanatic. Mm -hmm. These are these, the reforms are foreign to you. Yeah. Foreign to you. When when we talk about ladies not wearing pants, you say, What? Mm. That's in the Bible. And we're going to talk about that. Yes, it was in the movement. When you hear country living, you hear what country? Who? Where you get that from? That's going to the bush. It's foreign friends. 55 came on the scene now. 1984 came on the scene. That's where Avenue began to put on jewelry wholesale. Mm. Wedding band emerged with a big old rock in it. Preach. Now, friends, look what happens now, friends. The devil is diluting. Remember, of your own selves, the Bible says. Shall man invent perverse things. This wasn't the world. It was the church. Modern Israel followed Israel number two, and they followed Israel number one. Now look what happened now, friends. 84 came. Now, friends, if you came in 84, things were rocky. You haven't heard about 1901. You, you, haven't, you haven't drank this. This stuff, this stuff will tip you over. This stuff make you sigh and cry. You wrestled here. Friends, today we're in 2020. And this is where Advent, and I don't say it to be critical, friends. I say it to sustain truth, friends. Yeah. This is where we are, friends. This is where we are. That we are, we are at this dishonoring water. Mm. Since we are not hearing anything, we are not seeing nothing. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a lady the other day, and, and, and you know, I did some work, and she offered, she literally, literally offered me some alcohol. And I said to her, um, uh, I don't drink. And she says, why? I said, well, since you asked, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. She said, well, the ones I know drink. Yeah. Huh. She said, yes, the ones on my job, I know they drink and they party. Mm -hmm. You see what happens, friends? The same thing the Christian church did. We give it a bad name. Mm -hmm. Friends, this is where we are today. I'm not being critical, friends. That's why we have to be turned to YouTube. Because we hear nothing, all we, we hear and see is compromise. And if God doesn't intervene, brothers and sisters, we're going to die in the wilderness. Now look what happened now, friends. The difference is now, God is not going to cause us to disappear and call another movement. He's going to put those who are in apostasy asleep. And he's going to bring in others to take the position. Saints, an enemy hath done this. This is where we are today, a falling away. And that's why the exodus was so germane for them in Egypt. The whole purpose of the exodus was to bring them back to the faith of Abraham. So as we go on this journey, the exodus is to bring us back to where the pioneers were. The mission, the mandate for we are, we are so far now, we don't know where we are. Where we are. As I close, not in your handout, we are told. We're told in first selective messages, uh, 122, she says. So now please read for me now, the old standard bearers. The old standard bearers knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer. There it is. That's Jacob, Israel, right? And to enjoy the outpouring of his spirit. Uh -huh. But these are passed off from the stage of action. And who are coming up to fill their places? Question, who is coming up? What caliber of preachers are we putting out? Keep on reading, please. How is it with the rising generation? Uh -huh. Are they converted to God? Uh -huh. Are we awake to the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? Do they know about a sanctuary? Mm -hmm. It's not being preached or taught. Keep on reading, please. Or are we waiting for some compelling power to come upon the church before we shall arouse? Are we waiting for a coronavirus to get us off our, 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 our cushion? Mm -hmm. Look what she says now. Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? That time will never come. Friends, let me go back to my chart. If, you're, if, you are, if you are expecting 20 million Adventists conservatively to get back to the, the 1863 message, movement, lifestyle, think again. You're waiting for the cows to come home. And where I'm from, the cows never come home. The whole church ain't going to do this. Are you crazy? It would be nice. But I'm a, I'm a realist, that's a surrealist. It's not going to happen. Look what she says now, right? She says now, 
There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest, prevailing prayer. We must enter upon the work individually. Here it is, friends. We must pray more, wrestle more, and we must talk less. When she used the word modern Israel, she is referring to people who are gaining the victory, who are wrestling with God in prayer. And friends, the only thing can help us right now is a serious revival and a reformation. Mm -hmm. And you can't fly revival in. Huh. Revival begins in your closet. You can experience revival in your living room, in your bedroom. Let's get back to basics. Friends, I believe our greatest need today is a revival. Amen. And therefore, I want a revival in my soul. Sing it. I want a revival in my soul. I must apply to the blood of Jesus to get the revival in my soul. Here it goes now. Send down the rain, send down the rain, send down the gospel rain. Send down the rain, send down the rain. Send down the gospel rain. It's coming down, down, down. It's coming down. When the glory of the Lord is coming down. Hallelujah. When the saints begin to pray. And the Lord shall have his way. And the glory of the Lord is coming down. Don't you want a revival? Yeah. Friends, I believe that if we seek for it with all our heart, mm. we will find it. Mm. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, as we reflect and as we studied, there has been a falling away in our own individual lives. We are not where we used to be in our devotion to you and to this message. Mm. Through prosperity, and a life of ease, these things have encroached upon our spirituality. And here we are at the end of time. And there is no difference between us and the world. Oh God, revive us, we pray. Bring us back to our first love. Bring us back to where we saw the light. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Hope you were blessed by this morning's study. We will go live at 5 o'clock. Share the link. God bless you and Maranatha.